This episode is going to be about uncertainty, because a lot of what anxiety is, is really just an intolerance to uncertainty. Now, why do we have an intolerance to uncertainty? Well, mostly because uncertainty in our childhoods was excruciating. We felt helpless and powerless. We had no control over the situation. If your father's an abusive alcoholic or mentally ill, as mine was, there is a lot of uncertainty in childhood to start with. And if there's trauma associated with that uncertainty, it really makes it so much worse and so much harder for our little psyches as children to be able to develop a pathway that is going to allow us to metabolize that uncertainty and accept it and see it as a part of life rather than this horrible, horrible thing that it usually winds up being. If you have significant trauma as a child, if you are physically, emotionally, sexually abused, there's a lot of uncertainty in your life as a child. So when we face uncertainty as adults, that template for uncertainty isn't one that leads us to being proactive or feeling like we have some control. So we naturally kind of fall into that uncertainty intolerance, which is why we worry. The reason why we worry is we make the uncertain a little more certain. Now, it's a painful certainty when we start <laughs> when we started worrying about something, but in our anxious brain, worry is seen as the lesser of two evils than just leaving something uncertain. And to heal from anxiety, really what we have to do is become more uncertainty tolerant. And a lot of becoming more detolerant comes from cognitive understanding. This is uncertain. What can I do about it? But a lot of it is how do I bring my body back into a state of relatively calm reflection? Because when your body is in that sort of calmer state, you regain parts of your brain, prefrontal cortex that allow you to regulate and stay in your window of tolerance when you are faced with uncertainty. Whereas typically, highly anxious people don't handle uncertainty very well at all. In fact, it really is one of the biggest features that create alarm in our system. Because that's how it started. You know, there was a lot of uncertainty when we were younger. If you had a parent who was abusive, who was neglectful, who was just not there, there is this feeling like, what's going to happen? What what is going? What is my... Am I safe? Am I safe? Really, that's the biggest choice of all. Am I safe? And it's not a choice for children. You know, you either are safe or you're not. And I think depending on how sensitive that child is, if the, if the child is very sensitive, that child will lean over to the unsafe part so much more often than say, well, a more insensitive child. I don't want to use that word insensitive, but there's children who are born sensitive like me. And there's children who are born with more sort of internal resilience, like my brother. Things don't bother him so much. He doesn't internalize so much of that stuff. But I do. I'm a lot more sensitive in general. And I've used a lot of things to be able to deal with that. But along with that comes with this anxiety disorder that I developed. Because in dealing with my schizophrenic father, there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And... The, the thing about uncertainty for, for us worriers is that uncertainty was so horrible for us when we were young. Like it was so terrible to feel uncertain because usually it was followed up with something major. You know, my clients, patients, friends, whatever you want to call them, who had uh, an alcoholic parent, things would go along fine for a while. Then there'd be a binge and a blow up and then the alcoholic would kind of make amends it would be calm for a while, and then the buildup would come up again, the blow-up would come up again, and then it would go calm. So it was like calm for a while, blow-up, and then calm for a while, blow-up. So there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty in that calm period, the quiet before the storm. So I see a lot of my anxious patients with this kind of patterning when they were younger, is that things would go along okay, and then all of a sudden they would blow up. So there's this sense like, I can't let down my guard. I can't allow myself to feel safe because 
I know there's going to be a blow up. Now that blow up might be six, 12 months down the road, like it was with me. My dad would come back from the mental hospital and he'd be okay for six, 12, sometimes 18 months. But part of me, after he'd been in the hospital a few times and he'd come back and he would sort of fall into mania, depression, psychosis again, after a while, I stopped trusting that. I stopped trusting the fact that that things would get better and I knew they were always going to get worse. So I always have this sense and I still to this day have this program in me that says the rug is just going to get pulled right out from under you. So, And that comes from my childhood. And a lot of my friends who had an inconsistent parent or a parent that was abusive or violent have that same pattern where things were okay for a while and then they blow up. And then the uncertainty around that as a child, because you have no control over this situation as a child, you have no control. So it winds up that uncertainty when it shows up in our lives as children, it creates this template for how we're going to deal with uncertainty for the rest of our lives, which is usually not good. And the original uncertainty is, is feeling separate from yourself. If there's trauma in your home of origin, your family of origin, Children tend to blame themselves, and I've said this before, you know, when you abuse, neglect, or abandon a child, the child doesn't stop loving the parent, they stop loving themselves. And then the jabs start. Then they start judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming themselves because there is all this negative energy running around the house, and I can't blame my parent because my parents are in charge of looking after me, so who's the only person left to blame? Well, yourself as a child. So we start feeling this alarm very early because we split from ourselves. We split internally because there's part of us that wants to be authentic, real, loving, caring self, and there's the other part that has to react to whatever shit is going on in our house. And children take this stuff on. So we wind up getting this split when we're younger, when we start the inner critic, judging, abandoning, blaming, shaming ourselves. And that creates a tremendous amount of alarm in our system. And that alarm is what keeps us out of our rational minds, and it also makes us worry. So that alarm in our system that gets locked into our body goes up to our mind, and our mind makes up stories that are completely consistent with this alarm in our body. So when we separate from ourselves as children, when there's trauma in our household that we have no control over, and then we start blaming ourselves for, typically, not always, but typically, that alarm is read by our mind as this uncomfortable, scary energy in our system. So the mind, being a compulsive, meaning-making, make-sense machine, makes sense of that alarm by worrying. And then it also creates this hypervigilance, this sense that, okay, I I can't let my guard down. I'm not allowed to let my guard down because things go badly. So in in my case with my father, I love my father dearly. He was never abusive or violent. He was a, actually a really great dad when he wasn't, you know, psychotic. You know, taught me how to ride a bike, you know, hit a ball, all this kind of stuff. But he would also go manic or psychotic, where as a child and even as a young teen, this was very disturbing for me, very scary for me to see a parent like wide-eyed up for day, up for four days at a time, making all these plans. And it was really scary for me. So what I wound up doing after he had been back from the mental hospital three or four times, I'm getting to be 16, 17, 18 at this point, is that I I make this unconscious decision that I am going to withhold my love from him because the more I love him and the more I see him collapse into horrible depression, suicidal depression, or mania, or psychosis, it's too hard for me. Like, it's just too, too hard for me. So what I wound up doing was withdrawing my love from him, or at least drawing it back, and then being vigilant about keeping myself safe, keeping myself safe in that I know this, it's like that t-shirt that says, I'm in my own little world, but it's okay, they know me here. So I knew this hypervigilant state. It was familiar to me. And even though it wasn't satisfying as far as my human connections go, I mean, I've been married three times, it it obviously impacted me, but it felt safer than allowing myself to be vulnerable and then giving my heart to my dad again and then just losing again when when he went psychotic. 
So I learned that to keep yourself safe, you have to keep yourself vigilant and and vigilant and and avoid connection because here's the lesson excuse me here's the lesson is that when you are connected to someone that is the most vulnerable place you can be and that's the way a lot of us were as children we were highly connected to our parent or parents and then when they let us down or or what's worse they abused us where do you go from there like as a child where do you go from there there really isn't much safety in there and i think again like i've talked about in previous um podcasts and stuff is that we lose faith in the world. We lose faith that there's something out there that's keeping us safe. And I talked about that when I talked about health anxiety. You know, when you have a parent who's sick, we start getting introduced to this fact that we could get sick as children, very young. So the illusion of the safety of life is broken. And then we lose faith. And when you lose faith, what happens is that you start relying only on yourself. And when you rely only on yourself and you become an alpha child, as I've talked about in some of my other um, posts, that alpha child mentality doesn't allow you to be warm and close and connected. It's a very, it's a very kind of, um, how do I put this? It, it, it's a structure that we create to keep ourselves safe, to keep some certainty in how we're going to interact with others. But in that certainty, in that rigid circuit, in, in that rigid circuitry, there's no room for love. There's no room for connection. So of course, what happens is alarm gets worse and then our anxiety gets worse. So when we're faced with uncertainty as adults or late teens, our go-to is to go into our heads and start to worry and start to ruminate because we are trying to make that uncertainty a little more certain. So the, the what I've used before is you have a headache for a few days and you think, oh my God, it must be a brain tumor. Now, that thought must be a brain tumor is scary, but to the brain provides a little more certainty. It's not this sort of amorphous, like, oh, you've got this headache. So in a perfect world, you'd say, yeah, I have a headache, whatever. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. But the uncertainty intolerance that we have as as anxiety people doesn't allow us to do that so we have to make a reason up for the uncertainty to try and make it at least feel less uncertain because in our brains that actually provides us with a, a millisecond of relief and that's why we keep doing it that's why we keep worrying because when we make something a little more certain with worry especially like health anxiety it feeds that dopamine circuit in the brain that makes us think, okay, you're on the right track. And it takes us away from that uncertainty because that uncertainty was so painful. When you're a child and you're in an environment where you have no control and you're being traumatized, that's about as bad as it gets, I think, because our brains are so fertile at that age. We have such an inability to discern what's safe and what's not in the universe and then when, when our, our own homes aren't safe, we develop this sense of hypervigilance because what we will do is we will avoid that alarm in our body by going up into our heads and overthinking and overworrying in an attempt to make the, the uncertain a little more certain because uncertainty to us, especially if you had uncertainty as a child, is probably the worst thing that we have to deal with. So how do you, how do you deal with that? when you have anxiety? Well, as always, the first step is awareness. Like awareness of what's uncertain. What is uncertain in my life? And when, when something comes up to you, comes, comes up in your, in your environment, your emotional, physical environment, that's uncertain, that would normally just trigger you right into alarm, which would of course trigger your anxiety and the whole alarm anxiety cycle starts all over again is realizing how can I see this as just uncertainty? That's all it is. And can I stay with that sense of uncertainty? Can I actually embrace the uncertainty? Because you know, uncertainty really is the spice of life. If we knew exactly what was going to happen to us, life would be pretty boring. So it's really about how do you handle uncertainty? If you struggle with anxiety, uncertainty is one of the biggest triggers to go back into alarm, 
which triggers off the, the anxiety in your mind. And the anxiety of your mind triggers more alarm in your body. And it just becomes this cycle and we can't get out of it. So what we need to do is we need to really start recognizing where uncertainty shows up in our lives. How does uncertainty show up for you? Is it in relationships? You know, is it in your schooling? Is it in your work? And just realize, hey, this is uncertain. I can find the alarm in my body and put my hand over it, breathe into it. Just sit with the uncertainty rather than, and just watch your mind's compulsive and relentless drive to make that uncertain uncertainty a little more certain. And usually we do that by worrying. Worrying is kind of our go-to. It is something that, that we're so used to. And I do think that we get a dopamine hit from worry because it's so familiar. It's such a go-to. And in a way, because the worry has taken a little bit of the uncertainty away, we see the worry as a bit of a friend. But it just creates this alarm in our system and the alarm creates more worry and we get caught in this alarm anxiety cycle that we can't get out of. But our brains have been trained to go uncertainty, alarm, worry. And then we just get trapped in there. So we never actually learn how to deal with uncertainty because every time something becomes uncertain, we go into alarm and then we go into worry and then we go into that alarm anxiety cycle and uncertainty is now back in the wake. It's not even there anymore because we've transferred that negative feeling into a different negative feeling. And it's like the alarm because if we don't actually find the alarm in our body and learn how to connect with it, learn how to metabolize it, it will always hold us hostage. Same with uncertainty. If we don't recognize, hey, this is uncertain. This issue with my partner is uncertain. This issue with my friend is uncertain. My career is uncertain. Can you just see the uncertainty that is essentially the essence of life is uncertainty. And if we're going to go into alarm and anxiety every time that we feel uncertainty because uncertainty was so excruciating for us when we were a child, we're always going to get caught in this alarm, anxiety loop. We're never going to be able to get out of it because we never deal with the root cause. We never deal with the root cause, which is the alarm in our body. And we never deal with the root cause, which is this uncertainty tolerance that fires the whole cycle up. Because the whole thing is red hot. By the time we actually have the wherewithal to look back on it and see what it is, we're already kind of in this clouded state of consciousness. Our prefrontal cortex has been paralyzed by the cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine that's running around in our system from this survival physiology, from the worry over the uncertainty. So by definition, we're not aware. We're already in this kind of brain foggy haze. So what I'm trying to say is, can you become really, really aware? Can you make it the intention to be aware of just recognizing the uncertainty in your life. Even when you have a menu at a restaurant, like that's uncertainty. Am I going to get the quesadillas or am I going to get the steak? Like, Just recognize how does your body handle uncertainty? On top of that, when you have something uncertain that is troubling you, say you do have health anxiety and you've got some symptom that you're focusing on, where in your body do you feel that uncertainty? Like where does it come up for you? Because that's the core, that alarm is really the core of what we call anxiety. We worship the mind in our society. We believe that anxiety is these thoughts and these worries of the mind. That's just the byproduct. The, the original, the cause of anxiety in the first place is this alarm that's locked in your system, locked in your nervous system. So if you can recognize that uncertainty, anything that's uncertain, you know, even what movie am I going to go see tonight? Like there's, start recognizing where uncertainty shows up in your body. And chances are that's the same places where your alarm shows up too. Because uncertainty uh, was brought into you know, fruition with this alarm. So when we were younger and we experienced uncertainty, like I did with my dad, I started creating this alarm. For me, it's in my solar plexus. So now I know that when I start getting worried about something, I can reverse engineer that and go, okay, where's my alarm? It's usually in my solar plexus. What am I uncertain about? Can I understand the uncertainty? Can I really start 
putting the uncertainty into my mind and going, what is the question that I'm worried about here? What is this question that I'm worried about? And where do I feel that in my body? And then when you find that alarm that's linked in, that's hitched up to your uncertainty, really focus on that alarm. Breathe into it. Allow it to be there. See if you can nurture it. And the next podcast, I think, is going to be on on being grateful for your anxiety, which is going to be a, a big one. But be grateful for it because it does act as a beacon for you to heal it. If you just had this amorphous, free-floating, negative pain and emotion, we'd never be able to pin it down. We'd never be able to deal with it. But once you start seeing that uncertainty is really at the root of your alarm, and we start dealing with the alarm and the uncertainty, we really start developing a template in our minds and bodies so that this uncertainty, this anxiety doesn't automatically fire us down that same railroad track of anxiety every single time. Once you develop the awareness that uncertainty is a trigger for me, the alarm is a trigger for me, can I figure out what my triggers are? Can I see my alarm? Can I see the uncertainty? And can I actually sit in those things and allow them to be present as opposed to just running away from them? Because I think that's really, really what's key is that we run away from both the alarm in our bodies by going up into our heads and worrying, and we run away from uncertainty by worrying, by getting up into our heads. And this has been our go-to since we've been children. So what we need to do is, is recognize in awareness where these things come up for us where the uncertainty comes up, where the alarm comes up. And once we start realizing the alarm and the uncertainty are mixed together and seeing them for what they are, then we really start getting at the root cause of what's causing your quote-unquote anxiety. And once we start getting at the root cause of your quote-unquote anxiety, which is this uncertainty intolerance and the alarm, we can really start chipping away at the structure of the anxiety that's really making your life miserable. So the take home message is how can I relate to uncertainty in my life? How can I see it for what it is rather than have it automatically trigger my alarm? And as soon as my alarm is triggered, my anxiety is triggered, and then I've lost everything. So it's really about how does alarm show up in my body? Where is the alarm in my body? How does show up in my life? Can I recognize even the smallest instances of uncertainty? And also, When you are anxious or alarmed, can you backtrack and say, what is the uncertain issue that probably triggered this entire episode? Because again, once we start looking at the root cause, which is uncertainty and tolerance and the alarm and metabolizing those, feeling grateful for those, being connected to those things and neutralizing them and integrating them, then we start getting ahead of the anxious thoughts of our mind. So we're actually getting to the root cause of what we call anxiety. Because unless we get at the root cause of the anxiety, we're always just going to be bailing water out of that rowboat. We're never actually going to be getting at the root cause. And the root cause of anxiety is uncertainty and tolerance and this alarm in your system. They are linked together. If you find them in awareness and start being able to sit with them, maybe even embrace them, then we start to heal.